before you. Awesome, welcome everyone. So great to be here. My name is Bethany Wigan and I'm a co-president of ASLI along with my friend and co-president Laura Barvis Roden. It is an incredible pleasure uh, to introduce Walking Alone and Together, Marika Hecht, Michelle King and Shamira Williams, or as you see them in this awesome photo from Marika's Twitter feed, Shamira, Marika and Michelle. My computer is a little overwhelmed at the morning and refuses to go into presentation mode. So bear with me as you see this smaller version of the picture. I had first encountered their collaborative work on Twitter on a kind of gloomy April morning <laughs> earlier this year when I had spent too long doom scrolling on a Saturday morning still under the covers. The hashtag walking alone and together jumped off the screen at me and I switched over to purposefully reading all of the information about the project that I could find. I'm a walker myself and as an educator, I believe in the importance of educating the whole person of experiential learning and embodied knowledges. I've been known to give my classes walking assignments sometimes alone and sometimes together. And this summer, I am starting work to connect three walking, learning environmental humanities groups at my own university in Philadelphia, in Toronto, and in Oxford, England. This is all by way of saying, as I learned more about walking alone and together, I finally woke up on that gray Saturday morning and I began to wonder if we, Laura Barbus Roden and I, might persuade Michelle, Shamira, and Marika to, to, to show us more about the project and provide a workshop here for the Astley Conference. So we met a few times in May and in June, and I am just so very pleased that we get to kick off this conference with this remarkable and extraordinary group of artists and educators, extraordinary both alone and together. Over to you. Thank you so much, Bethany, for welcoming us and all of you joining us here today and sharing a little bit more about what we are each bringing into this space. Um, we're very excited to be here today. And um, we wanna just share a little, a little snippet of um, what we've been up to. Hopefully my sound is gonna come through. Aww. I told my kids to stop watching the Olympics so that my streaming would work. We'll see if, if she listened. <laughs> Good morning, what? good afternoon, maybe. We're, we're in the afternoon now, we're in Pittsburgh, so good afternoon. Oh. We are three co-conspirators, mixed flock, and are very much looking forward to sharing a little snippet 
of how we got to this place, which is a card from our 53rd week of meeting. Um, it's now probably been, I don't know, what do y'all think? 60 weeks, something like that. We're way past 53 now. Um, so we're gonna kind of go back a little bit in time to bring you to where we are today. Yeah, so it's it's interesting. Oftentimes, when you see a project or something, we often want to look at the endpoint and say, "How did you do it?" Um, and I would say, actually, we got to go back to our origin story. And so, um, I think about what uh, each of us are um, rooted with questions and longings and yearnings, and I think we spend our lives grappling with those and living into the answers. So. Um, if you recognize those of you of my generation, 68 representing that sepia tone, thank you very much. <clears throat> On the photos, that's a classic uh, 1972 Afro. Mm -hmm. um, little shout outs. Um, I think I was you know, rooted with the questions of belonging and home. And um, so I feel like it's by no accident that I'm in community with Marika and Shamira and uh, walking alone and together and being with their questions and longings. Kick it to you, uh, Marika, with a fantastic overalls and turtleneck. I forgot that I was supposed to wear my hair in pigtails today to match. <clears throat> I still do, by the way. Um, I, I'm a city girl. I grew up in New York City. I've lived most of my life in cities, but a bit itinerant, although I have been in Pittsburgh now some time. And I think questions I've always had from childhood, from moving a lot in childhood is, trying to understand my relationship to place and what place I belong in. So echoing Michelle's questions about belonging um, and really trying to find a place that feels like home. And I definitely think that this learning refugia that we are hoping to expand with all of you is about building a home together that I'm like, so grateful I get to do with Michelle and Shamira. Our young one, Shamira. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, 78, you know, 10 years difference. We can see how technology has allowed color to change uh, for photos, right? And I will say, you know, this picture of me is actually taken on the back porch of our home next to the garden. And for me, that's just so meaningful of where do you belong? Where do you plant your seeds at, right? That was my non-human mentor were trees this year. And so we'll get into that. But how do you plant your seeds and who's watering them? And so it is an honor to be with Michelle and Marika as they have watered the seeds that I have planted and helped me stay faithful and belong and hold, right? And sometimes even weeds, we have a little thing <laughs> I've said, are you the fungus in your own garden, right? So sometimes it is who's in your garden and who is who is helping you water and weed that garden of the things you plant and where do you belong? So I am very much excited to plant water and weed with Marika and Michelle as we go along. Here's some metaphors. <laughs> well, we've got a whole thing about metaphors. <laughs> We're all about metaphors. <laughs> um, so, you know, like Bethany described her own um, discovery of Walking Alone and Together, Walking Alone and Together is actually a project born out of Twitter. Uh, we, we three know each other in real life. We've been at, we've worked together on projects. We've hugged each other in real life, but we also have a very robust Twitter relationship. Um, and so back in September of 2019, Shamira and I had a little back and forth about this idea of like, what would it mean to have youth and elders be the guides to really understand communities and help educators in communities connect better with the specific places, the specific neighborhoods that they exist in. Um, you know, and like so many things on Twitter, it was like, oh yeah, that's a cool idea next. You know, it's like there's 12 more in, million more things in the scroll. But then it resurfaced as things do that have power. Um, and 
it bubbled up again between Michelle and Shamira and I, and, and we decided very, very early in the pandemic, it was like the second week after, after our community had, had kind of closed in to get together on Twitter, what would, or I'm sorry, on Zoom. What would happen if we just had a conversation on Zoom? We knew we couldn't all be together in the same room. Let's just talk about walking. So we met. And then what? Well, we're, we're big fan girls of poets. Um, and Mary Oliver is one of our patron saints. She says the attention is the beginning of devotion. And it really resonated like when you look at your life, what are you really serving? Um, and what are you paying attention to? And, um, you know, it's interesting, we don't live according to seasons really anymore. And uh, it was still winter coming on the edge of winter, finishing out. And winter is a time of um, dormancy here in Pittsburgh um, and reflection. And to spend that time in reflection and wondering about things and uh, going into something we had no lived experience, no individual or collective lived experience of being in a pandemic. Um, and what it afforded us by giving the attention and time for wondering, you know, for wondering um, and being in community over time. You know, so think about, even if you look at your life right now, what are you habitually mm -hmm. serving? intentionally or in an unintentionally? No judgments, just a, a question. Was that me? Oh, we love those words here. <laughs> we decided we I, wanted to loiter together. And so after the, you know, our first Zoom call, we charged each other with doing a walk every day and then journaling about it or documenting it. And we said, oh, we'll come back the next week and talk about it. And we never thought it would be 60 weeks later that we were still doing it, but it was a way for us to just say, hey, take some time, reflect um, on, on where you're at, where you're walking, what can you notice? What do you see? who's there, right? And for me, it allowed me to loiter. I had been a go, 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 got to get to the end. But that loitering and walking just became something to just say like, take a couple of minutes and, and press pause to actually stop and embrace where you're at, be present in, in the space and time that you're at. So I appreciated it the first week. And so it just kept going. And so it became our weekly practice to meet every Thursday and discuss. And we had, you know, robust conversations. I will go to the instigator of our, many of our conversations. Well, you know, it's really interesting, we uh, loitering. And I, hopefully you all got a chance or will have a chance to listen to Ross Gay uh, talk about loitering. Um, but if you think about, um, you know, non-consumptive transactional experiences, and it actually gave me a goal to be like a loiterer, uh, like as, as, a, as an elderly goal, like I want to be 90 and loitering still, or another word that we love, Marika. Flaneur or flaneuse. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, to walk aimlessly. And there's something about, you know, uh, when you look at words, um, to respect is to re-see. And what it allowed us to do is to kind of re-see our environment, re-see our lives, um, when you really are just kind of attuning and staying with it. And um, we kind of loved this project into existence without really knowing by just coming back together week after week uh, in really mundane ways. And I think that's something that um, has stayed with me. It's like, what how am I living life in ways where I value love and justice and compassion and it's in the mundane that just coming back week after week, day to day in just small ways. So this is a little bit when we got to be outside. It's still on Zoom. And I wanna um, just give a huge thank you to Shamira who 
took our ramblings. We, we're very active in the chat. Like we're like, we're talking, but we're also dropping stuff in the chat, references and ideas. And if someone says something cool, we drop, we try to transcribe it quickly. Um, and every week, Shamira takes this vol like voluminous stuff and turns it into these cards. And so we have a card, you saw the first one was very spare. It was just kind of a directive. And then these cards start to evolve over the course of the year. And so there's like a theme for our week, week 17, land, language, liberation. And then there are these questions that we would um, keep coming back to this noticing, pondering, wondering. Um, and they get even more developed and rich with references and, um, and Shamira is still rocking it on these cards. So we literally have a book. I don't know if you have it near you, Shamira, the one you bound, but we have all 52 weeks of the first year um, together. And it's incredible to go back to them. They're very rich and we are spending some time digging back into them. For me, the best part about the cards is that you don't know who the card, who was speaking and until Mariah could tell, until one of us tells you, you don't know who makes the card. The conversation is, is sometimes the words that I pulled, we pull together are half of two people's conversational points and they just came together and wove together. But for me, looking at the cards is the magic of what happens in community when you're able to just sit and listen. I tried one time to be the typer or, you know, like try to capture everything and it wasn't the same. And so as we, as we grew as a mixed flock, we all seemed to just know how to water and weed the conversation and plant the right seeds, right? There is, of us, there's one person who is always the seed planter, one person who's the weeder, and one person who kind of does the, the artsy part of it. But when you see Walking Alone and Together, it's the three of us, we are a triangle. It can't happen just one of us. We've tried, I think there's of the 60 weeks, maybe two weeks, one person didn't show up. And while we still had good community, we, we understood that it took the three of us in order to make walking alone and together the rich thing that it is. And so we are, you know, that, that showed us what a mixed flock can do and should, you know, and goes about creating. I would also give a word, senius. Senius is a word created by Brian Nino, who's a generative composer. And senius is a collective genius. We often situate things in the individual solely as they're disparate and um, disconnected. But as Shamira said, no part of this work is actually just uh, one of us individually. <clears throat> Again, coming back to 1968, 71, and 78, it's our lived experiences, our big data of our lives that is weaving in and out. It's also what's happening in the world. It's the George Floyd murder. It's the Breonna Taylor. It's the, um, you know, folks being displaced by um, in housing for the homeless and housing insecure. It's also the wildfires that are happening. It's also the droughts. So no, you know, when you are seeing these cards and seeing these conversations, you're actually, um, in fact, we are representing a collective wisdom um, but also time, we, we each hold time in our bodies and our lived experiences. And I think that's what's really beautiful about this. It's not one of us, not one of us could be it, not two of us, but the, uh, the collective genius. We have another, another Mentimeter question we invite you to participate in. Um, which is a question that we probably touch on, if not talk about exhaustively every single time we connect, which is what are we imagining for our collective future? Marika, can you drop the link uh, back in the chat? Oh, there it is. Thank you. Uh oh. Wait. 
You gave me the same one. Give me a second. It's the same link. Oh. Yeah. It still showed me the same question. You can actually advance it to the next slide. Click oh. next question. One of the things that I think developed for us over time was our comfort with silence and sitting together um, and just thinking. And some folks actually that's in the like, what are you bringing into the space actually had science, silence as their answer and uh, trusting silence. And I feel like for um, growing up a good part of my life in this culture uh, likes busyness, likes the noise. And I read a piece years ago that said, um, busyness is a, another form of laziness. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what, but I'm American busy is the gold standard until you you know it's not sustainable and it doesn't actually um, um attune you to what's most important in your life and i think you know this walking alone and together especially coming back week after week um it became real clear what was important to me to us um individually as, as women, as scholars, as human beings, as all, all the kind of intersectional identities that we hold um, and how we are um, responsible to each other's well-being and how we can hold each other's sorrow and joy as well when you come back time after time, week after week. And um, one of the like superpowers that uh, Marika has is um, her background in the sciences. It's not like, it's not the background in the sciences. It's the love of the sciences <clears throat> and love of like connecting other people with us, with science. And we have become like huge science nerds. Well, I became more one. And I'm we like, were always nerds. nerds. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but mixed flock, yes. that's fine. This is, this is one of our big metaphors. And part of what, I think we all have discovered, and, and I imagine what many of you explore in your own work is, you know, how through observation, we learn about the world outside of us, but also the world within us. And in the winter, have we got any Berbers out there? Like mixed flocks are these lovely things in the winter in the woods where you get these different bird species together. And there's theories about why they're together. Is it for protection? What is it, you know? but we started to think more about how we are like a mixed flock. We're all our own individuals. And when we come together, we have this stream, we have more protection, that's the refugia. We also have more playfulness, um, which we always try to remind ourselves to come back to. Um, so we definitely consider ourselves a mixed flock. Mary, you want to talk about green, the green book? 
So, or oh, if you don't know what the green book is or a green book is, um, a green book is at one point in time, there was a book that was used to help guide people of uh, color or African-American people through the United States of where they could stay at and be at in a safe space. And so we've created our own internal green book of people who've been guiding us on this journey. Um, for our playfulness, we will say that it started with Kara Gaunt's um, Kinetic Orality, where she talks about how, you know, the things that you do or a transfer of teaching, right? Like some things can't just be written, they needed to be modeled and shown. Um, and she has a great TED Talk video. And then we have some people like Natrice Gaston who does um, tech and art. And I believe that is Ross Gay here and Audrey Lord and <laughs> yeah. uh, Lee Patel. So. Yeah, uh, shout out to Marcel uh, Haddix who talked about um, the internal green book, green book and like what's guiding you. And I think about um, how we are, you know, beings that are like um, both grounded by the past and are seeding the future, right? And who's informing us um, as human beings, as readers, as thinkers, um, as lovers, um, and I think about uh, really deeply influenced by, you'll see some other people, but like um, drawing upon indigenous wisdom, whether it's the Anishinaabeg people and Leanne Simpson in Canada or Robin Wall Kimmer here, you'll see um, this constant coming back and learning and what are we being told over time uh, generationally that is informing how we make sense of the world. And for folks who may want to delve deeper into our green book, um, we have kind of a running and evolving Google sheet that has all of the references. We've combed through all of the chats that we've had over these many conversations and cataloged all of the references. And what's what I think is cool about it is it's like everything from serious philosopher to this was a really funny ad I saw on YouTube and y'all should watch it because it relates to something that we're talking about so it's very varied there's music in there there's all kinds of stuff and there's the link to those resources and of course there were some people who when we started to look through um they come up again and again and again they were like really our deep touchstone people like um Alexis Pauline Gums which I hope everyone is engaging with this book, which is like, it's so short and, and we challenged ourselves to read it slowly, um, to just read a little bit every day and take our time with it. This, this has been very powerful. Um, if folks are, I feel like there's a lot of academic types out there, the, um, K. Wayne Yang's book about um, a third university as possible really has helped us think about what it means to exist, whether you're in academia or government or nonprofits or business, what it means to exist within institutions that are um, deeply problematic and how we find might find ways to what he calls hotwire them to kind of undermine some of the, the negative behavior of that institution and, and force it to maybe serve a, a larger good. So that is also a thing that we have come back to a lot because it's a struggle when we're inside of these systems. You know, we're talking about building this refugia, but we don't live inside of this mixed block refugia all the time, right? We get an hour a week together on Zoom if we're lucky, right? But mostly we're existing in this larger world that is so problematic um, and painful and violent. And so how do we try to bring some of what we discuss and, and enact out into this larger world. And, and valuing the you know, public grappling of these ideas, right? To um, the concepts, the ideas. Um, we're huge fangirls of Robin Wall Kimmer. And this comes back to language. You know, one of the things we'll, you'll see later, we're, we're going back and looking through our notes and, um, and looking at the words. And it's really interesting to see words what are, how, are, how is our language informing us about how we are world building or world destroying? 
And I love that uh, Robin Wall Kimura talks about, you know, we need a new pronoun in thinking about ki and kin because we don't in our own language have <clears throat> earth as a living being, a living entity. And I see, um, and I just, you know, was really attractive about being asked to be a part of this conference is that seeing that how we treat the earth and how we treat um, all beings are interconnected. If we're anti-black, we're anti-life. If we're anti-queer, we're anti-life. If we're anti um, this disabled trans folks, if we're anti-Semitic, we're anti-life. And so seeing these things as inextricably connected, right? Um, how we talk about the world, how we talk about the earth and how we talk about each other. And it has really um, had us interrogate what is the language that is actually calling us home or actually driving us further apart. Someone, someone out there in, in this virtual room said, oh, a lot of metaphors. We, we speak in metaphors so much. And it's funny now, I feel like every single thing that I do is somehow connected with walking alone and together. So everything I read now for me comes back to walking alone and together. And so I was just reading, I don't know if folks um, have checked out uh, Catherine McKittrick's new book, Dear Science. Yes, thumbs up. It's very, very powerful and in there. Um, as soon as I read this, I was like, oh, it's walking alone and together. Metaphors function to radically map existing usable, entwined material and imagined sites of struggle and liberation and joy. Metaphors move us. Metaphors are not just metaphoric though. They are concretized. And that's been so important for us as we think about these metaphors that guide us is how do we concretize them? How do we make them part of our material um, work? And a big part of that is really exploring this idea of refuge and what it means to be a refugee and what it means to create refugia or a refugium. And I, I would say one of the things too, did I come in in your time, Shamir? Mm -hmm. Oh, I appreciate that. That smile's like giving me life over here. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody. Um, is that, you know, we asked this question of like, what does it mean to be indigenous to a place? T to really know a place and be responsible. And I remember something Mariko said years ago about, you know, being a steward. And there's something very powerful about that word and, and, and being that relationship to the land. Well, to, to be a steward is to be in right relationship, to know a place over time. Um, like a lover, right? In the, uh, not just next week, but uh, a month from now, a year from now, 10 years from now, what does it mean to come back to notice a place over and over and over again? I think um, gives us a sense of, responsibility with our small little lives of what we can do to be stewards and to be um, complicated ancestors. I'm struggling to find the quote, but um, uh, Candace Fujikin talks, I think very beautifully about what it means to think about your relationship to place when you are not indigenous to that place. Mm -hmm. um, and if I can find it, I will drop it in the chat. Um, her book is called Mapping Abundance for a Planetary Future. Um, and it was very helpful to me as someone who is from a diasporic people and doesn't have a land that I can claim as my people's land. Um, how do we, find deep connections with land nonetheless. Well, you made, I want to say while you're looking for, while you made us fall in love with the word refugia, because you were like, I'm, I'm not even sure how it came about, but you know, refugia about a place that exists under intolerable conditions. And I think that I'm not exactly sure. Well, of course, <laughs> week 12 <laughs> was when it came about, but uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, we're in the midst of like one wave of racial reckoning and <clears throat> what was happening in 
out west with the fires burning, what was happening in Australia. And, you know, it's like, how can, can we actually have a practice of creating um, a place that is loving and just and honorable in intolerable conditions and situations? We are also, we were under our former demagogue uh, amongst other things that were happening in the midst of uh, folks dying and um, due to inequities and inequities complicated by COVID. So um, I think refugio became this very powerful word It's not by accident, it's our title, but also um, a kind of siren song about how to be in the midst of chaos. So one thing we asked of ourselves a little bit more than midway through the first year, who, how did this come about? I can't remember. How did we come it to was, this? It was a new year and we didn't yeah. want to have, you know how you have the like new year's resolution. You're like, I got a new year's resolution. And like week three, you're like, I'm out. I just didn't do it. And I feel bad about myself. Um, <laughs> and this came from Lisa who we have a, another, we have two people who, my partner and her friend out West who now is in Asheville, like created their own walking alone and together. So we know like it could be done. And she saw what we were doing. They have a different relationship. They actually just write back and forth to each other um, in the same document. And they create cards also in their own way. Um, but Lisa Kitt had this article about, uh, about how New Year's resolutions kind of worked against you and they made you feel bad and didn't support. And so we, um, I'll, Shamir, I want you to say more about what we did and talk about yours. Oh, so we, we actually met on what? New Year's Eve and Christmas Eve and just talked about like, what did we want to see in the future? What had we learned so um, from this point and what were we carrying on? Um, once again, you can't tell who's is who's, so that's kind of cool, but you know, one of us was looking at buoyancy, <laughs> um, decay and transformation, emotion <laughs> and discipline. We may be able to decipher which person more than human mentor is a mushroom. <laughs> because we've been on mushroom walks together and <laughs> um, trees and water and how, what do they mean to us, right? How are we looking at them and what do they go to? Um, we all have a mantra for the year instead of a technical resolution. And how might we want to go, once again, come back to attention is devotion, right? How are we attending to these mantras that we have set forth? And how do the questions that we set forth for ourselves in the context of the world help move us forward and stay in community as a mixed flock. Um, how might, I would say that mine is how might I make the time to do it right, which goes back to me always being busy doing, 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 and now being able to loiter. And it is hard to just be like, you know what? It may take me an extra hour. I just pause for the brewing to happen, to let me think about what is happening and what I'm doing. And it's so much better. It's just so much better in that experience. But it also allows me to have that ripple effect across the people that I work with, right? Because now it's like, hey, why can't we all just take a pause for a minute and think about it? And I like to tell people, where are you going so fast, right? Especially in a meeting, right? You want to go to the next thing. And it's kind of like, does everyone understand where we're going? what is going on. And so these guides for us have helped all of us move through the world, but it's also helping us help other people move along with us in this new refugia and the way that we are thinking. And so very many times I, am, I have to ask, where are you going so fast and how might I make the time to do it right? The one that I struggle with the most is how might I be of service to the world in the midst of confusion, danger, injustice, and indifference? Because that is requiring a, a new trust for me to build. And so how do we continue to build that trust in this refugia and spread it out amongst the people that we work with and be in community with like today? Yeah. 
Do you want to say something about your Marika? Like whether it's maybe just treat- that um yeah, I water is has been very important for me and transformation has been a theme for me this year. Um but one thing about water that's so elegant is it is like us. It's a three-parted molecule and that's part of its stability and it's just amazing that it's able to take so many different forms, persist for so long as a stable molecule, um, but also sometimes release parts of itself kind of in service to, you know, chemical reactions. So I've been thinking about water a lot and trying to fully immerse myself in water whenever possible. Um, It is like the most healing, even if it's like a yesterday I went to my neighbor's like kind of junky above ground pool and it was still awesome it wasn't as awesome as when I got to go in a waterfall in Glacier National Park a couple weeks ago but still just to be completely in water under you know under the water with your head you just get out and you just feel better so water that's my jam and I know a slight surprise, but I am the one who's got mushroom on the brain. And when I tell people, they often think like, oh, psychedelics. It's like, oh my gosh, there's a whole world beyond that world. <laughs> Mushrooms that are very similar to us as humans, almost the exact same, inhale oxygen, breathe out CO2. But I love mushrooms because they're the great decomposters of the world and they can break down anything carbon. And they can actually produce things that are healthy and that you can grow out of even in the destruction of those toxicities. So what would it mean to be in it and not of it? What does it mean to be in toxic environments and actually create something anew? What might it be to be invisible in doing this work? And so I feel like we have all of these teachers, not just our human teachers that we show we were connected to, but who are our non-human teachers that are also teaching us about how to be in the world. That's just a little snippet of the mushroom rabbit hole. But if you would like to join, 412, <laughs> but yes, I'm not joking. Um, but you see how they allow us to keep coming back. It's not something, you know, this is back in January, but we're still talking about these questions. As Shamira said, we're still grappling with these things. Um, and so that, that becomes, you know, it's really interesting when you want to transform something, but then don't expect to be transformed. I feel like we've been transformed by our own questions and mantras and words and going back and looking at our work. We already admitted that we're, that we're geeks. We're a bunch of nerds. <laughs> and so we just wanted to continue to nerd out on this project. And so we rented this little, uh, we rented a, a small space in a um, transformed old elementary school that is now a community center called Community Forge in Wilkinsburg, which is just outside Pittsburgh. And you can see we put up all of our cards and um, we brainstormed and we've just been trying to to make sense of of all that we've done and try to find those patterns and um, see who popped up over and over again. So that's been our summer activity. We've actually been able to meet Um, in person, which has been awesome. We've been meeting twice a week this summer um, to explore these ideas more. I am definitely saving the chat today, which is, (laughs) there will be a card. There will be a card today. There will be a card. Yes, the cards. (laughs) Um, we also just talk a lot about like what is science and what is research and how how are we able to broaden our understanding of what that is so we really consider this project a research project Um, we're researching ourselves our relationship with each other our relationship with the world we're back to our card so that was our story of how we got really how we got to to Bethany's invitation, um, which was right around the one year mark, I think, fortuitously. That was very serendipitous. Um, 
We have another question for all of you. Uh, Natalie, we can. <laughs> um, I think a lot of the the pictures that you're referring to are from Rika in a period where we, we talked about um, decay and transformation, especially, in re and we just thought about how do we see decay in our communities um, and what is being transformed and how might we transform things that we once thought was broken and to be tossed out. I definitely know that was the broken pottery was like, did it needed to be thrown out or could it be repaired and restored? Um, the dead bird was really a dead bird and we talked we were talking about decay and how how it happens and how we don't always take notice of it, right? It's we just see it. But I'll let Marika go into a little bit more depth about the pictures and then um, another set of detailed pictures are from Michelle. I think um, the pandemic really surfaced grief, a lot of different kinds of grief, in a way that I think climate change also surfaces grief, personal and collective grief for what is lost, what we are losing, what we're witnessing losing. But we also have talked a lot about um, an American fear of death and loss and a need to understand that that is part of life, that death brings us closer to life and that if we wanna really change the society that we live within, there has to be a death and loss of some things, maybe even some things that we like and that we'll have to let go of them. Um, and what does that mean? And so for me with the pictures, it's like, this is where the attention is the beginning of devotion comes back. It's like, well, if we're gonna try to embrace transformation at a societal scale, we darn well better embrace transformation at the micro level. You know, so how do we attend to death and transformation? Just when we walk through the neighborhood, all those pictures are just like within five blocks of my house. I noticed someone put in the chat, was lovely that they encouraged their students to expand their definition of home. I really like that idea so much. We really have expanded our definition of home and our and the kind of um, the catchment that we move within as our home. Um, so I've just been trying decay and transformation are my words. I'm just trying to attend to them more closely. So the invitation. The invitation, we gotta get to it. We have an invitation. Yes. We have an invitation for you all to join us over the next uh, two weeks uh, to walk alone and together. Um, and, um, and invite other people, just as, um, you know, what's really beautiful um, with um, Bethany and Amy is an invitation for us to be seen. And that is a great gift to another being, is to fully see them. Um, and so we invite you to also be seen. 
you see us and we see you by posting what you, you know, I don't know what you're, if you're on social media, if you're abandoning, letting that die, uh, or, uh, but we have other places that are not social media. Uh, if you use this hashtag walking alone and together, we're hoping to build a, a senius amongst this community and be in discourse with this community and all that you're connected to. I want to say a little bit more about the specific like kind of like non-social media treasures. Oh yeah, we have a Padlet that you can add um, resources, comments, notes, your reflections from your walk onto. Um, we also have a Padlet that is a map. We would love for you to drop a pin so that we could create a map and see how we are and where we are in the world, what is home in our expanded definition, right? Um, and we have a playlist on Spotify. We would love for you to contribute a song, a song that gets you in the mood to be transformed, a song that gets you in the mood to be happy, a song that gets you in the mood to sit and be still and just think. Ponder, wander, notice, sit on your porch. And we have a website um, and the, the URL is walking alone and together pgh.com. And you can go there and find all the resources that we talked about and links to the Padlet and links to the Spotify playlist um, over time. And we'll just keep it there as a space where we can hold and it's our little digital refugia of our knowledge bank, right? Um, I think I covered them all. Yeah, well, this part, you know, the, the wish, the grace that we, um, that we send off on every card, mm -hmm. what do we say? Save the chart. <laughs> yes. Well, we do say save the chart, <laughs> but our card is also that—that that is a mantra. Save the chart. Um, uh, but to enjoy your walks, be patient with yourself, and to notice, so that you know you live into the practice of gentleness by being gentleness. I love what uh, Leanne Simpson said to to wear the teachings. So how are we being the teachings? So we, that's a little reminder for us and for you. Also save the chat. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny because it's only funny because we said it when we talked to Bethany earlier, and now I see the note that the chat is in save mode. <laughs> and we would uh, love, I would, on behalf, is to thank uh, all the beautiful labor that we see that is both visible and invisible to us. Uh, we are grateful for all those beings including your own that brought a level of attention to us into making this space possible and to making uh, future refugias possible. Thank you. Thank you for your time, your energy, your knowledge, your wisdom, watering and weeding. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the three of you. Thank you to everyone who joined us. I am so excited to go out and walk with you alone, but I already feel so much more together. This was such a wonderful way to begin our conference. I'm so grateful to you and I can't wait to continue the conversation on Twitter and Padlet and I'll be listening to the playlist again as I have been these last weeks. Thanks to you all and see you online. Yeah.